I've watched a lot of Dead Mouse's streams, videos, tutorials, and more. I've uploaded a lot of Dead Mouse's videos on this channel. And as you can imagine, after listening to a lot of what he has to say, I've learned a lot about music production, the creation process, and overall making music as a whole. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about my five favorite things I've learned after listening to Dead Mouse. Number one, keep it simple. This is a big one I've learned from a lot of his streams and videos and tutorials that not saying his music is simple per se, I mean, the mixing, the mastering, his sound design, of course, especially using analog synths and whatnot, of course, very complicated, but it's interesting that through this complexity, he creates these melodies that are very simple and easy to understand. Of course, though, these simple melodies take a long time to create and generate. However, I think one thing about Dead Mouse that makes him such a genius, especially when it comes to making just a huge impact on the electronic music community, is the fact that a lot of his songs have this very simple, you know, kind of major minor chord progression um, in terms of just something that anybody can understand and easily resonate with. This is something I've learned a lot. For example, even with Morgan Page, another famous producer, he stated that the average person only really listens to three things or can understand or hear three things in a track. And I think as producers, a lot of times, because this is almost a kind of production, a battle for lack of better phrase, we wanna make sure that each one of our tracks is as complex as possible with this insane stuff going on and coming in and out and whatnot. But the truth is, like Morgan Page said, you can really only focus on three things at a time. So even if you're having all these crazy melodies going on with crazy sound design and all these different elements happening, at the end of the day, the more simple and easy to digest the song is, the better it's gonna come off overall. And I think this is where Dead Mouse really shines is that when it comes to the simplicity of his tracks, the melodies are created in such a way, and obviously I know it takes probably a long time to create that perfect melody that yes, maybe it could take you I don't know, 30 seconds or a minute to recreate in MIDI that melody, but to create that melody from scratch, trying to figure out the exact right chord progression, the exact right, you know, maybe lead or arpeggiation or whatever you're kind of going for, it takes a while. And it's almost kind of a unique process that you take so long through all this complex music theory and testing out for hours or sometimes weeks or months or even years to create that perfect melody that's super simple, it hits in just the right way. Number two, wait to release. He mentioned this in one of his videos talking about how he made it as a DJ, or I'll put DJ in quotation marks, and an electronic musician. This is a big one, I think, that for, not only when it comes to demos, but obviously a lot of these tips have crossovers with other tips or suggestions I've heard from other artists. This is a big one that I think for a lot of producers, when you first start making music, one, you're not making any money, right? Unless you're already DJing at clubs or bars or whatever. One, you're not really making money from music. I mean, I guess even if you are DJing, you're not making money yet. And I think that you kind of get in this mindset of, oh, once you make your first song, you have to send it out. Once you make your second song, you have to send it out. And I feel like every artist goes through this unique process. This is something I went to that I remember I made my first kind of three or four songs. I immediately sent it to everybody, every artist I could find. In hindsight, those songs were trash. You make one song and it's trash. You do this again and again and again. And this is true, I feel like, for any creative field. You know, even Mr. Beast, who makes YouTube videos, said your first 100 YouTube videos are gonna be absolutely horrible because that's just, it's part of the process, right? And I think this is a big thing to wait to release it because if let's say you send a demo to an artist and it's a horrible demo, it's like say your fifth song you've ever made and it's a horrible demo, they're like, oh, this is not that good. Next, you send them another one, like your 10th song, and it's not that good. They're like, eh, I'm not gonna listen to this person anymore, right? So you really only have, typically within reason, like one big shot to really stand out and showcase your skill set as an artist. This is absolutely huge. You wanna wait to release. And I know, I think the biggest thing, I remember learning this in psychology, is called delayed gratification, that it's very easy to work at something and say, oh, I wanna release this right away, show people what I made. But honestly, it might take you two years to make that song that actually has some weight to it, you could say, okay, you know what? I made 20 or 30 songs already, 50 songs already. The 51st song, you know what? This one I actually think has something to it, right? Where I actually want to now promote it. Maybe I actually want to make this my quote unquote first release, right? I mean, for me, my debut album I had in 2015 called The Light Nearby, 
But before that, I had, I don't know, I don't know how many songs I made, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, maybe more. I'm honestly not sure. In hindsight, all of them horrible. A couple of them unique ideas, I will say in hindsight, but like most of them were absolutely horrible. But this is part of the process. And it's one of those unique things, I think, when it comes to creativity. And this is true for, like I said, making YouTube videos, making music, painting, acting, maybe writing, like writing book or whatever, that the better you get at your craft, the, and I mean this in kind of a funny way, the worse you actually realize you are. Like when I first started making music, I didn't realize how bad I was at making music until I got better at making music. It's almost this odd paradox that the better you get, the worse you realize you are. And then at a certain point, when you become self-aware, you're like, wow, my tracks are really bad. I should not be releasing these. I should not be sending these out. Then you get to a point where then you're like, okay, now I can hear or I have the the skill set now to understand how bad I am, which means now I have the skill set to improve on how bad I am. But at the end of the day, and I think this is true for so many artists, wait to release, especially your first 10, 20, 30 songs. I say just keep making music and wait till you get to a good point where you're like, okay, this song that I made, this new single, this is one where now I'm on like a good trajectory. And this is one that I actually can now release because it has a lot of weight to it. It's actually a solid record. Number three, small steps. This is another big thing Dead Mouse has talked about that when he was kind of in the process of learning electronic music and production and everything, that each song, he tried to focus on one element and get good at it. And I think this is really, I think important for, I guess learning anything, but I think especially in music production, there's so much to it, right? I mean, even for me, I've been producing for over 10 years now. I'm still learning and I've been in music all my life. Former uh, classically trained in piano for 10 years, jazz saxophone for seven years. I'm still learning things about music theory and especially when it comes to music production, there's so much to it. And I think it can be, it can be super overwhelming, right? You're trying to learn everything from, you know, how to create a MIDI line, right? And create like, uh, typical chord progression, right? When it comes to music theory, then you're learning about arrangement. Then you're learning about even human psychology and the engineering of sound. You're trying to learn all these kind of different technical elements of production, like, you know, not only just mixing, mastering and arranging and everything, but also EQing, reverb, I mean, chorus, phasers and flange. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. And one thing he talked about is for each song he made, he tried to get better at one particular element. And I think this is a really good strategy because like I said, even if like, so you pull up Ableton, for me, I use Ableton as my main DAW, and you look at the audio effects, each one of those audio effects could take you a long time. I mean, even if you look at the Ableton reverb, which by the way, as a side note, that's my main reverb I use. I only use Ableton reverb. I don't use the Pro R or another, you know, Valhalla reverb or whatever. Nope, just the Ableton one. Each, you know, one of those settings on the reverb has very different you know, uh, drastic differences on how it affects the reverb overall. I've watched videos sometimes that are about a half an hour-ish long, only about the Ableton reverb going over each individual knob and what it does, right? I mean, and, and that's just reverb, right? Then also too, it's not even just the reverb. Even if you know exactly how it works, it's like, well, are you gonna parallel process it or not? Are you gonna add the reverb onto a whole chain or onto one element? How's that reverb gonna sound in your track overall? Are going to EQ the reverb too to make it blend better? So it's not even just about using and knowing the reverb, but how you use the reverb with the entire track as a whole. And that's just reverb. That's just one audio element or audio effect, if I'd call it that, in your song. And there's so much more, right? It can be very overwhelming, especially in the beginning. So my best suggestion is say, okay, I'm just going to focus on one particular thing. It could be a uh, music production technique. Like I said, EQing. You're just gonna really focus on EQing all the elements in your track as best as possible and watch a lot of tutorials and just kind of messing around to see what works and get better at EQing. It could be something else, more of like a conceptual thing where you're like, okay, for this track, I'm gonna really try to have my bass hit hard, right? I know a lot of people, especially, you know, when it comes to bass music, like dubstep or trap or whatever, they want their bass to really hit hard on a big system. Maybe you say, okay, that's my goal for this track. Whether it's EQing, whether it's having a good mix or good master, whether it's knowing how to have certain things punch in the right way, whether it's to avoid different phase cancellations on the low end, which can obviously mitigate your bass, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just going to focus on that. I think by taking small steps and basically for each track, try to get better at one thing. Like for this one particular track, you want to have a good arrangement. For this one particular track, you want to get better at how to have a very suspenseful build. On your next song, you're going to have maybe the opposite. You say, okay, I'm getting better at how to create a suspenseful build, but on this next track, I'm gonna make sure that the first initial 
couple seconds of my drop, really hit hard, because that's what I want. Make sure you sm take small steps, because I think if you go into it too much by being like, oh man, you know, I'm gonna, on this next song, get better at all these different things at once, it can be too overwhelming, and you're gonna get better at, in kind of blips almost here and there. And as Deadmau5 says, take things one step at a time, and for each track, try to get better at one thing. Number four, the witching hours. This is a big one he talked about with Steve Duda in his kind of three-part series when he was doing it with Razor Music. And he was saying that a lot of times when making music, he doesn't really get into like a flow or things don't really start coming together until super, super late in the morning, like three, four, five, six a.m. in the morning. And this is something I've noticed actually as a common thread among a lot of creative people, like authors, for example, as well, have mentioned this. I was actually, ironically, you know, before filming this video a couple of days ago, I was watching a podcast with Tim Ferriss and Andrew Huberman, Tim Ferriss being a, I think, five-time number one New York best-selling time author. And Tim Ferriss, ironically, as, you know, super, super famous author, one of the most famous authors in the entire business world, was saying the exact same thing Dead Mouse was saying. He's like, look, he's like, when I write books, I have to start writing at midnight or 1 a.m. I write till sometimes five in the morning because that's when I get my best work done. Then I go to bed and also my sleep schedule can be all over the place. But as Tim said, when it comes to writing, there's something about doing it when you don't have distractions, you know, you, no one's texting you or calling you, the world's kind of quiet and you can really hone in. And Dead Mouse, ironically, said the exact same thing when it comes to making music. And this is something I've noticed for a lot of entrepreneurs, for creative individuals, that they get their best work done which is very interesting at either very early in the morning or very late at night slash early in the morning, depending on which way you, uh, you look at it. I've heard of some authors saying, hey, I wake up at 4 or 5 a.m. I have a nine to five job. They're like, they, I wake up at 4 or 5 a.m. I write till 8 a.m. So I write for four or five hours, but in the early morning when everybody else is sleeping or other people say the exact opposite, like Dead Mouse or Tim Ferriss saying, hey, I don't start working till 11 p.m. or midnight. But then I work till about four or five in the morning, again, when the world's quiet. I think it's a big meta thing too, picking a good time or testing out different times of when you make music the best, I think is a very unique approach. For me, when I first started making music, I found for whatever reason, I don't know why, my best time was from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. So waking up at like say your average time for a lot of people around 8 a.m., then working till about the afternoon, 12 or one. That for me was my best time. Then I kind of started messing around and started realizing, wow, you know, I actually make music way better at night. So then I was only making music at night. Then I kind of went back and forth. I'm like, you know what? I actually think I'm making better, I make uh, better music. After I wake up, maybe do some stuff, then I work out and I don't start making music till two or 3 p.m. So I only started making music from like two or 3 p.m. to about 8 p.m. And I'm just kind of that kind of weird window. And I feel like over time, I've made the best music in an odd way by testing out different hours of the day that I make music. For example, two years ago, I was only making music right when I woke up. That was my best time to kind of make music. I'd make music when I woke up, I'd then film videos, then work out, and then that was kind of my schedule for the day. Now it's the exact opposite. Now I wake up, get some work done, film videos like I'm doing right now, then I'll probably work out, like say after editing and uploading these videos, and then I won't start making music until tonight at like seven or 8 p.m. until whenever I get done. So I think a big kind of pro tip is one, see if, if that works for you in terms of working like super, super late as Dead Mouse talks about, but two, maybe test out different hours. Maybe for you, midday is your best time to make music. And the, uh, the truth is you really never know. And I think everybody's different, but I have noticed, like I said, as a common thread among entrepreneurs and creative individuals, making music in the early morning or early night, or I guess even early morning as well, is, it seems to be the best time to be making music. Number five, time equals creativity. This is just a big overall one that I've noticed. Dead Mouse has brought up in a bunch of different ways, in different video streams, tutorials, et cetera, et cetera. And that is that when it comes to just making better music, you just gotta put in the work. You know, it's a very common theme. I think it was from Outliers, uh, the book Outliers, that the 10,000 hour rule that to become a master in something takes 10,000 hours. For a lot of people that have heard say, hey, you know what, especially music production, it's even more than that, right? And Demos kind of talked about this a lot, especially when mentioning um, on the big video of how he kind of made it, that a lot of it was him just saying, look, I didn't watch a bunch of tutorials, although back in the day, there really wasn't any. He's like, I just made music. I just kept make, making music over and over again. And if you really suck at something, and let's be honest, in the beginning, all of us are gonna be bad musicians. 
all of us, unless you're like Mozart or whatever, um, all of us are gonna be bad musicians in the beginning, but the better you get at it, of course, the better you're gonna get. It's just part of it, the putting in the time is the biggest thing. I do think tutorials are helpful. I know Demel's kind of bash tutorials. I think they are helpful when used in the right way. Like, let's say you're working on a song, and you're like, oh man, this, this reverb, to use that example again, is it hitting the right way? Then you go to YouTube and say, reverb tutorial, you watch it, then you tweak it. The problem that I've seen with a lot of musicians, and I think this is what Dead Mouse is talking about, is almost like, almost like this paralysis thing, or analysis by paralysis, where, or paralysis by analysis, excuse me, where as opposed to making music, which you, sh you should just be doing, they then say, okay, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna work on this first song, I'm gonna watch an hour of tutorials, and then a second hour of tutorials. And people tend to be watching tutorials way more, spending hours, as opposed to just making music. You're gonna get way better at making music by just going for it. Like that mouse says, time really equals creativity. And as you can imagine, the more you make music, the better you're gonna find your own sound, your own voice, and just overall get that creative process and those juices flowing. But you really have to put in the time and you have to put in the work. And I think that for too many people, and I've noticed this a lot, they almost, which is not necessarily, necessarily a bad thing, but they watch tutorials and, and videos about making music almost as entertainment. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but the problem is if you kind of fall into this trap where you're just only watching tutorials and you never even make a beat, that's not really gonna, in my opinion, gonna get you anywhere. Those tutorials should be there as kind of like, a, oh, I'm doing this, I can't figure something out, now let me go to a tutorial. It should always be like a secondary thing. You know, as I know Deadmau5 has bash tutorials a lot. I think also too, I know we didn't have them back in the day. So to him, he's like, oh, it's super easy now. You wanna know how to sidechain compress, or do such a compression or whatever, you just Google it or put it in YouTube and boom, there's a bunch of videos. Back in his day, those didn't exist and you just kind of have to figure it out. But no matter what, I think at the end of the day, that kind of figuring it out process where you hit a huge wall, you're like, I can't figure this out. The more you push through it, the more you spend more time. And honestly, like the 10,000 hour rule, just putting in the work, the more time you put in, the way better your tracks are gonna get and the way more creative you're gonna get in terms of finding your own sound.